In tomorrow's Tinmold, the chair of the Tinmold Standards and Members Interest Committee, Speaker Watterson, will move his committee's report into matters relating to the dismissal of Rob Collister as Minister for Health and Social Care. This was, to say the least, an extraordinary event in the colourful history of ministerial politics, so what actually happened to provoke it? We'll hear from Rob Collister on next week's agenda. But this week, Michelle Haywood, one of the three health department members involved in the case, gives her take on things. You are one of the named parties in the report uh, into the events that led, I suppose, to the sacking of uh, Rob Collister. Um, It's hard reading the report to really understand what went on because the report... Uh, perhaps necessarily doesn't provide most of the the evidence on which the committee reports and also there's an independent inspector mm-hmm. um it it it's hard not to th- to read it and think gosh this is this is a, a petty little spat between three uh, backbenchers and a minister um yeah i can see why that could be a perspective you can take i think um the independent inspector have had lots of evidence and were pages of of evidence submitted with emails and and supporting documents and things to justify where things were. Um, We submitted a timeline of events because actually when you're asked about something a few weeks later, it's sometimes hard to recreate just what order things happened in and and who spoke to who. And then we backed all of that up with what evidence we had still available to us. and there is lots and lots of material there, so it's quite hard to sift through. But the 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 investigator, uh, having received that, then had personal interviews with each of us. So he went through, and I was really um, surprised, I think, at my interview because there were some very specific questions which gave me real confidence that he'd read in detail what I'd explained, and he tested out sort of key points to see whether you know what I'd written was was justified and and could be backed up. Um, so I think he's done quite a thorough job, but obviously because this whole matter involves quite a lot of civil servants who don't have the right to stand up and speak out for themselves, and you get to the findings at the end to find that they, you know, they had been subject to behaviour that wasn't appropriate. They are essentially the victims in this, and so publishing that evidence and detailing how they've been treated. It's, it's just victimising victims again. So I think you have to take the inspector's report as a summary of what happened. There are key points that are discussed in there, but there was more evidence and there were more incidents around those. And he's just picked out the, sort of the major ones as exam- examples of what was going on. I suppose m- most people's um, knowledge of how politics works will be based on TV programmes, perhaps things like The Thick of It. Um, but also they, 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 they'll have seen... Uh, some of the bizarre uh, happenings in 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 UK politics over the course of the last uh, four or five years, and they will see uh, much more aggressive political behaviours going on uh, there. Um, h- how has this ended up being such a big issue that that resulted in a minister being fired uh, only two months after being? Uh, put into the role. I think it's interesting to draw the parallels, isn't it? So you've got, you've got the likes of Dominic Raab at the moment, you know, subject to a bullying complaint. And when it turns out, uh, they start investigating more and more people come forward and say, yes, this was the behaviour. And there are obviously some civil servants for whom that kind of uh, bullish behaviour is acceptable. And there are others where it, it doesn't chime with where they are in, in the workplace or how they think their workplace should operate. Um, and I think all of us have got the right to say, this isn't how I work and this is making me feel uncomfortable. And it's not, I've seen comments saying, you know, it should be, they don't have to be snowflakes and, and all of that sort of stuff. Actually, nobody has the right to be treated poorly in in any context. It doesn't matter whether it's work or whether it's at home. And we've produ- produced lots of uh, uh, legislation around domestic abuse and coercive behaviour and intimidating behaviours there. But you're not, you don't, you can't be subject to those behaviours in a workplace any more than you are in your in your home. It's it's just not right. And so, I think in some ways the fact that we acted collectively was because of the impact on staff. It wasn't because of what we were subject to politically. Politicians have fairly thick skins, um, and we know when we put ourselves forward, we are in the public eye, and everything we do will be picked up and will be scrutinised and will be subject to comment uh, on social media. 
but we we took action when it became apparent that it was the that the department was suffering and the staff were suffering and that's why we spoke to the chief minister in the first place do you often swear in meetings uh, it's funny you mention the thick of it so i think it's a generational thing as to where do you think you know, politics looks like and i was i was too young for all the yes minister series the thick of it was much closer to my experience of of where i thought it was do i often swear no, and not with an intent to intimidate or, or belittle anyone and, and not with any aggression around it. Um, I'm a sweary person. I have had to make one apology in, in Timwood already because I managed to not say uh, dog mess, but I substituted in another word that was much more common for me. Um, and so I, I have, as I said to the committee, I'll reflect on my choice of language. I've got a, a much bigger vocabulary I could have selected something from. Overall, the, the inspector found two uh, or three charges against um, uh, Tinwell members in, in relation to Tinwell standards. One was against yourself and, and two against uh, the former minister, Rob Collister. W- one thing that the, the, the inspector didn't investigate was um, the, the, the whole political uh, relationship between yourselves, uh, the, the three um, members of the department mm. and the minister. Uh, that wasn't really covered. It was only the inspector only really looked to see whether um, Tinwald standards had been breached. Um, if there had been more of an investigation into the relationships between yourself, uh, well, your, the, the three um, department members and the minister, what would that have uh, uncovered? I'll pick you up on one bit there. So the, the inspector didn't find that I'd broken Tinwald standards. They said there was an incident. I held my hands up to it and they said but in this instant and the circumstances around it it wasn't a breach of standards if it had been I would have been required to apologize so um yeah there's the two findings against Rob in the in the interviews that we did with the inspector uh, there it was framed by uh, the chief minister's letter requesting that the Timwell uh, committee look at, at the events and then it was framed by a submission from Mr Callister who alleged, um, and as he said on the floor of Timwood, that we had behavioural problems, that we'd been uncooperative. Um, he alleged in Timwood that we'd been bullying as well. He gave a couple of examples, um, one of, of me swearing and one of uh, one of the depart mem- departmental members requiring somebody to leave a meeting. Um, that was found not to be substantiated, I've coughed to mine and the inspector went through with us about how was the relation, how did it work, how often did we meet, how were we meeting, had we been required to come into meetings, did we meet on teams and it had been quite common for us with the previous minister because we are all doing lots of different things to meet up on teams because it was convenient and it didn't matter therefore whether I was in DEFA for something else and then dialed into a, a political catch up or you know if 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 the minister wasn't there and he was sat at home in in Ramsey so you can still get together and we I think that hybrid working is becoming much more common now it but that's perhaps not something that the uh, the former minister Rob Collister was used to maybe um yeah I, maybe it wasn't and I I don't know how when he was in his role as chair of the MUA, I don't know how they'd managed those meetings, whether they were always in person or whether they did uh, hybrid work with each other. It was certainly something that we were all very comfortable with up to that point, and it was something that was raised as a, a, a as an issue. I think not that he'd raised it directly with us, but he said to the investigator that he felt we were trying to avoid coming into meetings, and we most certainly weren't. I don't think it perhaps he understood the workload that we had going on in regards to our departmental sort of responsibilities. Two months really isn't long enough, is it, to understand whether you can build a relationship with another um, politician? Uh, two months is, is yeah, it, it's a fairly short space of time. And actually, it's two months from the public perception until Mr Collister was sacked. It wasn't two months till those conversations had started. They'd started within three or four weeks of him joining the department where various incidents had happened and so we were in conversation with the deputy chief minister and the chief minister for about two and a half weeks or so before he was eventually sacked so actually the sh- it's, a, it's an even shorter time frame and I think my observation here is that it doesn't take it, it takes a long time to build good relationships but it doesn't take very long to 
break relationships down because it can be a a short you know, throwaway comment even that completely undermines a relationship and if you engage in those behaviours repeatedly with different people you can get into that crisis point very quickly should should the three of you have tried harder with uh, with minister or the former minister um i think we did I, I, hand on heart i can say i i tried on at least three occasions to sort of say things are, are not going the right way but you, you know, part of it is you sit there and you think well the political risk here of some fairly strange decisions that were being made by by the new minister the political risk starts to grow for for you as a politician and and you start considering do you need to stay in the department and it's balancing that what am i achieving in the department you know the reasons i joined and thinking that i could help drive that relationship between dhsc and manx care in into to maturing in a way that that you know does some good for the people of the island and and gives us a better health service and all of that is that worth it for the, the sort of the chaos and the the um, the poor relationship that was going on and the stresses that that was causing? And and you know, do I want to be associated with a department where we're starting to make strange decisions and the public are starting to pick up on that? And 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 the answer is almost certainly. I you you think well, I don't really. I don't need to to keep taking that. I, there are other things I can do politically, and I could go off and achieve other things. Um, and I think that's where, you know, the sort of the, the first <laughs> resignation came in. And I did, I didn't resign. I did sit and write a list of the pros and cons of of staying in the department and trying to work it out and 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 going. Because I was still there at the time, I had another couple of attempts of trying to stay and and see if I could make it work. But by then, uh, Joni had decided that that was her her she'd reached her limit and that's fine it's all for us individually to know what that is and the chief minister was then involved and then events unfold after that so I never got to the point of then having to consider whether I was going to resign or not because things were in train you're listening to Michelle Haywood MHK chaos is a very strong word to use uh, about the state of the department um it, it is a little bit, and I, not overall, and and not for its day to day things that were going on. But there were some decisions where we had sat in a departmental meeting with our advisors. We'd gone through, we'd discussed things at length, and reached an end point. And then, within a week, we were doing pretty much the entire opposite of that. Um, and it was, you know, it was ministers' decisions that were were driving those things that were just unpicking. And I think we'd been used to a collaborative team way of working and uh, minister hooper does say we're challenging but challenging in in the right way and and when you take a departmental role you can't stand on the floor of tinwood and challenge your own department you do that challenge within the department don't you and so that's entirely what we were expecting to do what we weren't expecting to do was being wrong-footed because we we thought we were at a decision point we'd got all the evidence we'd all discussed it that was what we were going to do and then Five days later, you find out on Manx Radio, suddenly we're back in court over the rants and, and appealing a judgment. And and that starts to make you feel undermined within the department because it makes you feel like your input wasn't wasn't needed, wasn't wanted, wasn't used. And actually, the position you'd understood based on all the evidence that you'd agreed was disregarded. And were you surprised at how quickly uh, the chief minister acted because in, in essence you know two weeks between uh the, the you know the first mention of of trouble and the, the minister being sacked mm. um would you have expected that maybe the chief minister to have tried to intervene and, and assist in, in, in terms of m- m- building bridges or um I, I think there was some element of that i think you know initially i think the um, chief minister was away at the point when this sort of first started coming out and so the deputy chief minister dealt with it spoke to all of us individually and um we we agreed um you know we'd go away and think about things and, and then um conversations were had with mr collister at the time as well and with senior civil servants and so you're getting this whole information you know bouncing around and by the time the chief minister got back from his trip i think they pretty much gathered what was going on and and discussions were made and, and we had the, well, do you want to leave the department? Do you know, how does this work? Can we can we put somebody in? I think there's a suggestion of putting somebody in to support him. But I don't think 
that what we were experiencing was necessarily understood by Mr Collister in terms of the impact that he was having. And so if he's not going to acknowledge that things aren't going well, it was hard to see how you were going to do anything other than the course that we ended up on. Do you, do you regret anything in, in, in terms of the way this is all turned out? I think it's in my nature to be highly self-critical. So, yeah, I would go back over everything and think, well, could I have done anything? Could I have gone and had more conversations more forcefully to say, you know, I really, really advise that we, we're not going down this, this particular route or that, you know, these relationships here are starting to to be under enormous strain and we need to do something to turn those around. And I think the whole thing just kind of unraveled so fast. As I say, once we, we got into that, conversations there was almost no stopping the inevitable um and I have reflected on it and I thought well could I have made more time to go and have those conversations could I have pushed a little bit harder but I did try but if you don't find receptive ground for those then it, you know you're kind of knocking on the on the table and not getting any response aren't you was it worth though effectively um at the allowing or, or the situation developing in such a way that um, a member of Timwald's uh, integrity is being questioned. Uh, effectively, he's been found uh, wanting in relation to honesty. Um, that's almost an unfortunate fallout from it. So the, the conversations we were having with the Chief Minister up to that point, uh, uh, when the Minister gets sacked, nobody knew about those. We were working very quietly trying to deal with the problems and trying to prevent reputational damage to to anyone nobody wants to see a fellow member of Timwald thrown under a bus at all and so we'd we'd kept everything we kept our council we'd spoken within the three departmental members because we were witnesses to the same events and, and but we hadn't gone outside of that it wasn't you know it wasn't widely known what was going on um so we were trying to be discreet about it. And even after his dismissal, we didn't publicly comment. We didn't say anything at all. And it was Mr Collister's, well, it was the, the question that came in on the floor of Timwald about losing ministers and then Mr Collister's interjection, where he accused us of uh, bullying and he accused us of uh, having behavioural problems and accused the chief minister of lacking integrity that really then unleashed the inquiry and so it's kind of almost ironic that the inquiry then finds that it's, it's not the chief minister that lacked integrity it wasn't us that was bullying and it wasn't us that was being uncooperative but actually it was Mr Collister that lacked integrity and it was Mr Collister that was bullying and so yeah although he welcomed that inquiry at the time it, it's kind of backfired on him and none of us wanted to. I and mean, we didn't stand up on the floor of Timwald when all those accusations were levelled at us because I think all of us were sat there thinking, I wish the seat would open up and swallow me. I really don't want to be sat here listening to this these accusations against my character because it was completely unjustified. But I was so mortified by it. I, I didn't speak. I sat there thinking this is an awful situation to be in. And my un my naivety, because then you lose the right to stand up and challenge those things ever after. So I welcomed the inquiry because I wanted to to correct that narrative. We weren't bullying him and we weren't being uncooperative and stroppy. We were trying to do our role in the department. The Chief Minister has served a, a full five-year term with uh, Rob Collister. Mm. Um, he must have known uh, how you know, Rob's... Yeah, what would you say is very abrupt style, uh, very direct and straight, um, uh, you know, and if anything, Rob uh, Collister uh, is known for sharing f possibly too much uh, information uh, with the public. Um, so th all, all this is known about Rob Collister. He's appointed to a department which, um, I think in, in your words, uh, ha was depleted of senior staff. Um, maybe that wasn't your words, but I'm putting <laughs> words into your mouth. But, um, but, but you know, we know that that was the case. Um, should the chief minister not have done a bit more to ensure that that relationship worked? Um, it's a hard one for me to sell. I, I can't can't get in the mind of what the chief minister does, and nor, nor would I want to. Um, 
he's obviously made his decisions at that time for whatever reason it was and it would be up to him to to speak to that um i hadn't worked with mr coster before so when he was appointed um no take either way on on that um obviously worked well with mr hooper and enjoyed that working relationship um and maybe naively expected to carry on in the same sort of vein but it wasn't ever sort of set out that that wasn't what was anticipated of us um so yeah when he was appointed no real kind of take either way um i've sat next to him (laughs) <laughs> as, as, as much contact as I have as we sit next to each other in, in Keys and in Dimwald and we share sweeties Still? No <laughs> No sadly not It's um, I think he sits to one side of the seat and I sit to the other side of my seat mm. and uh, yeah there, there's no sweetie sharing at the moment I did offer him one but he, he declined Is I mean is, is this um, a fundamental forever sort of breakdown now between uh, you, uh, Joni, um, Tanya and Rob Collister? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, d- I don't think, yeah, we've we've not got to the point where um, it's irretrievable. Uh, it, it has put a strain on all of the links between members in the Keys and, and Tim Ward because all of those members who sit on the Standards Committee, obviously I had to recuse myself from being on the Standards Committee, so they've kind of carried on without me which is absolutely right and proper but it meant that I couldn't speak with any of those some of whom I am quite close to in terms of friendships within uh, within Timwald and so that's been difficult for me uh, I've also known that you know Mr Carza we he, he's admitted that he had a real sort of like downtime about it and, and sort of his mental health was suffering and so in lots of ways I've backed off from talking to anyone who was a close associate of his because I didn't want to put them in a difficult position and I didn't want to to compromise his ability to seek counsel where he could and, and where he needed to um, but it, it's kind of almost feels like the honeymoon period is over and we've we've fractured some of those relationships. I'm hoping they can be repilt. I'm hoping that Mr. Collister accepts the report, accepts his responsibility in it and makes a sincere and genuine uh, apology um, that allows us then to start rebuilding some of those relationships. And finally, uh, have you learned any particular lesson from, from all of this? Yeah swear words are not necessarily a good idea in meetings <laughs> um i to be fair I, I you learn lessons all the time from every interaction you have um and as i've said i am quite a reflective person i have reflected on it i'm not sure if i went back to those days again what i could do that was any different to actually what happened um i don't think i can still see it any other way There are lots of things I've spoken to the Standards Committee and and the next sort of step will be to reflect on the process that that was in place. And one of the things I'm certain of is actually members don't have a lot of support. So actually within the workplace where you'd have access to counselling and and things like that, the the support that was offered to us was uh, presiding officers or the chaplain or the bishop. And, And one of the presiding officers is on the committee. The other one has to receive an apology. So they're both kind of involved in the process. And for Joni and I particularly, who aren't religious at all, the chaplain and the bishop aren't necessarily an appropriate support mechanism. So we do feel a bit like we've kind of almost been left floating around in a vacuum. And I think that there's some work to do to, to sort of say, well, actually, how do you... It's almost not quite whistleblowing, but it, it does feel like that. How do you raise concerns and how do you deal with those concerns in a way that doesn't cause more collateral damage? That was health member Michelle Hayward, MHK, giving her side of the events that led up to the sacking of Rob Collister. We'll hear Mr Collister's take on events on next week's agenda, and of course the whole matter will be discussed in Tinwald tomorrow. Was the Chief Minister right to sack the Health Minister? Was he right to appoint Mr Collister in the first place? Don't forget this programme is available as a podcast on Manx Radio's website. For now though, I'm Phil Gorn. Goromayo, thanks for listening. <laughs>